YK Water. Yes. <laughs> so you start an episode. You start with sponsor promo right there. Jordy, what are you Cheers. drinking? Got some YK water. Kelly, what do you what do you got over there? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> smart, smart. Well, we're staying hydrated on the podcast staying because uh, this little it's funny it's like a little mid season like lull like September is kind of a a pretty chill month right now, and then once like Paris hits, it's wild. Like, it used to be, like, May to September, like, Labor Day. Yeah. But now it's, like, a second season, I feel like. Because I was looking at the schedule. Yeah. And it's, like, Paris, and you're going pretty much nonstop through World Tour Finals in December. Till December. Yeah. Yeah, another tournament just got added uh, in yeah. Thanksgiving. It's Brazil. Yeah. So, after World Champs, a couple of weeks, and then Dubai, and then Brazil, and then World Tour Finals. So yeah. you guys are going to play Brazil? We'll see. Yeah. We're, we're planning on it. Because I know... Because yeah. at this point... I feel like you guys can be kind of selective, like what you play. Hmm. Do you see that at all? I'm not looking at the points, so I don't know. Yeah. Um, I would like to play in everything. Yeah. But it's like trying to figure out how much of an off season do we want, waiting for, you know, schedule for next year to come mm-hmm. out. Um, oh, yeah, I'd love to play in everything, but we'll yeah. see. Sometimes I think I need someone to say, it's okay to like stay home, you know. Yeah, because hmm. we've talked about it. I think when we, uh, when me and Jordy were playing, for those of you who are just listening, we got Jordan Chang, Kelly Chang, the Changs, the Changs. The Changs. You guys would be the first uh, husband wife combo on the show, but for our five year anniversary episode, we had Gabby and Delaney on, so we beat you guys oh, wow. to it. But so you guys are the first fun. like husband wife yeah. coach player duo, the Changs. The Changs. First one we've had on. Yeah, there it's we pretty go. fun. Yep. But when we were talking about it at the CBVA, finally got to play with you off the bucket list now. Had a blast. Um, like a key to a great work ethic is a great rest ethic. But right now, because there's so many opportunities to play, it's so hard to turn down tournaments, especially because it's an Olympic race. Like points are so big. Like how hard is it to just like pump the brakes and be like, you know, we, we can skip one every now and then. Or is it just impossible? It's so hard, <laughs> mm-hmm. especially with... Thinking back on our last run, you know, I didn't really know we weren't looking then either, but, you know, people would let slip, you know, you guys are in the third spot, you guys are close, like, right. and I was always like, please don't tell me, please yeah. don't tell me. Um, so there was like this need to play in every single tournament, which I think kind of bit us in the butt at times. Like, I don't think we should have played uh, Stad right before the Olympics. Yeah. Um, but you know, you live and you learn. So I don't know, maybe this is a time to, you know, pick and choose, but every fiber of my being is like, I want to go out and compete. Yeah. I want to go out and win some more medals. Um, play against the best. Yeah. Try to beat the best. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard. Like, <laughs> when you and Sarah Sponsel were making your run that you guys were so young. Like yeah. Sarah, we were 24 mm-hmm. and 25, I think. Which is like, I feel like it had to have been younger because Sarah walked like straight off of Gulf Shores and went, you guys played in Brazil. Was that your first one? Like straight into a country quota? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. We lost that country quota in Brazil to Brooke like and Carrie. It's super wind ball, right? Uh-huh. I yep. remember watching that. It was like one of those, just like a set goes up and it's like 30 feet from where it oh, started. Oh yeah. I'm going back to serve hol- holding the ball and I'm getting like pelted in the <laughs> face by sand. I'm like, where am I right now? This is crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's wild. And so you guys, like, I think that benefited because you were so young playing in that many tournaments. Do you mm-hmm. think that was like beneficial just to like get as much experience as possible? I think we needed that, especially yeah. with, it was really hard. Obviously, Sarah was still in, Sponsor was still in school. Right. So we were only training together once a week, sometimes twice a week if yeah. Stein was nice, like, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. which was awesome of him right. to even let her occasionally come out with me. So a lot of lonely training sessions, just me and, you yeah. know, coach. Um, so, yeah, I think we needed as much, you know, competition reps together to mm-hmm. find that flow because we didn't have we didn't have an off season. We didn't have that much training. Right. When she graduated, it was go, go, go. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> when do you think uh, you guys found your flow? Because even like going into Cancun, mm-hmm. you were still in country quotas there, right? Yeah. I mean, because you have what? Cancun, 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 
Ostrava. Yeah, we played three country quotas in a row. Like, that's yeah. so gnarly. And yeah. you mentioned that you don't look at the points. I'm yeah. wondering, because a lot of people, everyone's motivated by different things. Mm-hmm. Like, you look at certain, I, I think golf is the easiest comparison because they have the leaderboards literally just sitting there on certain holes and some guys yeah. are like i can't look at it like it's just gonna get me distracted and some guys like they thrive on it because mm-hmm. like oh i'm three behind this guy like i need to start making birdies yeah um but if you had looked at your points in cancun do you think that would have changed the way ostrava and sochi went because like statistically mm-hmm. percentage-wise i think you guys probably would have been underdogs to qualify and then like boom you won yeah it's i don't know if it would have been different i think my my favorite memory um, from, it, I think it was in Sochi. Mm-hmm. Um, we had been talking a lot as a team, you know, we're diving into uh, a lot of different volleyball things and a lot of off the court things, really trying to find, you know, our stride, our team, getting everything to click and work. And uh, Jordan kept using the language breakthrough is coming. And we're both just, I think, really trying to hold on to that. Like, oh my gosh, like it's, I feel like every tournament's an uphill battle. We've got country quotas, qualifiers. It's just, it's been a grind, this whole (laughs) process. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it was uh, after we won our, I think it was our quarterfinal match. In Sochi? In Sochi, yeah. yeah. I'm sitting in the bench and uh, I was just, like reiterating that, you know, phrase in my head, like, yes, breakthrough is coming. Let's go. And I heard clear as day, God say to me, no, breakthrough is here. And then we go and win two gold medals in a row. So it's just, it's special moments like that, that I love what I get to do Yeah. and just make it, it's hard to describe like the feelings, you know, Um, but that's what, you know, gets me up out of bed in the morning and keeps me going and um always you know praying for more <laughs> moments like yeah. that and i feel like that's kind of been our language the last like month like breakthrough is coming you know mm-hmm. we've been now sarah or hughes and i you know really diving into things and super excited to um execute some of the things that we've been working on um and i just i i feel a very similar tie like breakthrough is coming and i'm yeah. like is it time are you gonna say it like i'm ready <laughs> yeah. for it you know yeah. so it's just it's cool yeah i'm so did you want to say something uh yeah i mean I, I think uh i remember us using that language it's when you feel like as a coach you're doing a lot of the right uh the team's doing a lot of the right things and it's that darn you know quarterfinal match mm-hmm. that that fifth place match that i think haunts a lot of people because mm-hmm. uh, that's the difference between you lose and it's like Dang, what a bummer. You win, now you have a chance for a medal. Right. And, of course, I, I kind of kept track of the points, right? And we needed anything better than the fifth place. <laughs> and we yeah. got so many fifth places in a row. Mm-hmm. Or it was like, fifth place, fifth place, fifth place. And I'm like, man, I just feel like we're doing a lot of the right things. Yeah. And so just trying to instill a little, like, hope, and almost like determination, you know, like, mm-hmm. breakthroughs coming. I think you keep hitting that wall, you're eventually going to kind of break through. Yeah. Knock on the door long enough, someone's going to answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I feel like, uh, I mean, Kristen and Taryn, I mean, I, I kept jokingly calling them the queens of fifth last year because they got fifth in like six out of eight tournaments mm-hmm. or something in a row. Crazy. And then they get like La Paz, they win gold. And then ever since then, like fifth has been pretty elusive for them. Yeah. Like they've just been podium all the time. Is it, uh, is it more of a psychological thing or a physical thing, that breakthrough? Because hmm. I can't imagine that like, I don't think Kristen and Taryn were like a 25% better team than they were last year, mm-hmm. but their results are about 25% better this year. I think, it, do you think it's more like you get that win, you get that medal and it's a breakthrough? Mm-hmm. Cause you guys hadn't, I mean, you and Sarah hadn't won an event, right? And mm-hmm. then you went two in a row. Yep. Yeah. Like, I feel like that's more, that has to be like a psychological thing to me, mm-hmm. but I don't know. I could believe that. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I could see that though. I could. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd lean more towards psychological. I think there's ebbs and flows of seasons, like, mm-hmm. you know, where, where we are at now. So we got off to a hot start. Yeah. Right. And then teams are studying us. Teams are trying to figure out how to beat us. They're trying new things. And then you start kind of dipping a little bit. And then that fifth place match, you know, that we, we broke through a few times and it felt like, boom, like we're the team. And then right. now we're hitting that wall. And so mm-hmm. I think it's just kind of ebbs and flows of. Uh, season and yeah. where you're at. Yeah. Well, I think there are so many good signs for your team. Uh, one, you mentioned like this is you're like hitting a wall. 
Mm-hmm. That's a great wall to be hitting. <laughs> You're like yeah. fifth place at Elite 16. Like that's a, a wall. I think that's a great sign that that's like almost a floor for this mm-hmm. team. And I think inside of an elite team is having a really high floor. Hmm. And I think you guys have that. Like what is it at this point? You guys won your what first four tournaments you played as a team. Is that right? I think so. I mean, you won Huntington, yeah. Turkey. Both Tour Keys and then World Tour Turkey, Finals. Turkey, World Tour Finals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And then you got... Crazy. You got a, a terrible fifth at the Elite. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Everyone was like, what's going on? Yeah. So yeah. after you win four straight, though, like, what's a breakthrough look like at this point? Is it getting back on, like, that kind of a run? Yeah, I think with with this team, from the beginning of when Sarah, Sarah Hughes and Kelly became a team, conversations was, well, what's our goals? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think if our goal was to win... Or if our goal was to qualify for an Olympics, then as we win our first four tournaments, like we're on the right track, we're looking good. <laughs> yeah. You know, what I mean, we're, we don't need to change a thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that wasn't our goal. Our, our goal is to win a gold medal at the Olympics. And yeah. I think, as a coach, the way I coach and the way we train and the mindset we have is a whole lot different with those two different things. Yeah. Right. So winning the first four tournaments uh, is pretty special. Yeah. Uh, but you also have to take it with a grain of salt. You know, Huntington Beach was a. a uh, was it pro tour, tour, tour series. series? Yeah. Um, Torquay challenger, you know, Torquay elite, not, not full fields and not to take away from what the girls did. Uh, and then world tour finals, you know, pretty special yeah. winning that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, our, our goal is to win a gold medal. And so it's like, all right, we're doing some good things. We're on the right track, but we still have another year and a half. Mm-hmm. And guess what teams are going to start figuring us out. We're still a brand new team. There's a lot of things to work on and learn. And I think we're in that stage right now. You know what I mean? So, the goal is still the same, a gold medal. And as much success as we had early on, uh, grateful and I think reinforces a lot of our beliefs. Uh, but also we got to figure out how we uh, keep getting better and get ready for that yeah. Olympics. I think this is a perfect time, though, to have kind of this lull, Sorry. you know, mm-hmm. um, of teams figuring out how to beat us and us... Uh, you know, we have to figure out how to adapt and figure out how to get back on top, you know? Mm-hmm. And I'm super thankful that it's happening now and not, you know, the beginning of next year or yeah. right before the Olympics or yeah. at the Olympics. And it's those moments of, oh my gosh, like, what do we do, you know? Yeah. Because we've, I've for sure felt that a few times this year of like, gosh, like, can't get our footing. Like, I don't know what to do in this moment. I feel like I'm... Like, I've tried so many different things, now I'm just, like, beating my head against a door. It's not working, you know? Yeah. So, it's been uh, a fun challenge to figure out as a team, you know, study us, study the world, and, uh, you know, keep pushing each other to get better. I think it's been it's been good for us. Yeah. I think, like you said, sort of uh, slumping or lolling at the right time, because this is a stretch where you can afford to do that. And I remember yeah. when we had Jake Gibb, who you guys work with a decent amount still, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, he talked about how like, he would plan a schedule around when to peak. You know, at certain tournaments, like we just had to accept that we'd be not at our best, a little bit fatigued, so we could peak here. How do you try to peak when the season goes from <laughs> December to February? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think, you know, for me, I try to map things out at the very beginning of the year. Mm-hmm. And I look at the tournament schedule, uh, try to align that with, all right, this is the two players we have. This is the staff we have. Uh, you know, what what can we do with what's given with us? Uh, and then what, like, it, we talked a little bit about scheduling and how we try to decide things. You know, for us, we're trying to peak at this moment. And so there's almost, you can't time it out perfectly, but there's almost this expectation of, awesome, if we win, great. But guess what? Uh, we're, we're trying to repeat and sustain you know this success and is it sustainable right now i I don't know and Mm -hmm. right now it hasn't quite been sustainable so we're trying to figure out how to elevate that part and be a little more consistent um so in terms of like mapping out the schedule uh you know we we tried planning some and playing like the back-to-back tournaments yeah because knowing that paris and world champs are back-to-back i wanted the girls to get a feel of like okay this is what it's like to Mm -hmm go to La Paz and then have to go to Topeak right after. There's yeah. Doha and Doha. Yeah. Uh, and there might have been one more back-to-back that we had, but I think one more. forgetting. And then certain stretches. I remember talking to Andy and Miles at the beginning of the year. Did you talk to them about what their travel schedule was originally supposed to be? It was uh, It was like 12 weeks in a row. Bunch of challengers, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was gnarly. Dude, That's it was so like, gnarly. It was like, 
whatever the stretch started, it was like Yermala, the Dominican, Ostrava, <laughs> Stad, Canada, Canada, yeah. Atlanta. Oh my so it was like like back and forth too, like Crazy. all over the place. And Andy, Andy said that Miles checked three bags on their trip, but then they oh ended gosh. up because they kicked ass so much, they were able when they got the bronze in Ostrava and then winning Stad, they were like able Could to it. just like skip out on all the like the smaller ones that they don't need anymore yeah and i was like dude that would have been a grind <laughs> that, <laughs> Seriously. that's crazy yeah. Yeah. but the way that you guys talk about volleyball reminds me so much of andy and miles mm -hmm. where they can't get enough of volleyball <laughs> where like i've never seen any signs of burnout from volley from either of you which i think is remarkable <laughs> because like you're a, a coach player husband wife combo like you go to practice and it's volleyball and then you come home and i'm sure there's probably a lot and of volleyball talk volleyball. <laughs> like, do you ever get tired of volleyball i'm so curious like the and i think not just me but a lot of the listeners and viewers are really curious about like the husband wife coach player dynamic yeah it's <laughs> for sure volleyball a lot i think i for sure lean more on the side of Okay, Jordan, like, can I have my husband now for the next few hours? Can we just not talk about volleyball? Mm -hmm. And, of course, like, it'll still come up, which happens. Like, it's pretty, <laughs> um, it takes over a lot of our, you know, time. Um, but, yeah, there's ups and downs for sure. Like, it's, I think some of the most challenging moments are when we have an argument at home and then, we go to sleep and the next day we've got practice in the morning and oh my gosh, I don't want to listen to him talk to me, but there's my coach, you yeah. know, coaching me. So um, I've worked really hard on compartmentalizing and there's days that I feel like I do it really well and then there's days I do not do it very well. And um, I'm really thankful with uh, how gracious Sarah is uh, for me and I guess us. Um, and I think we've really tried to foster an environment of open and honest communication. So Sarah tells me when, you know, that was an awesome practice and tells me when, Hey, that like, wasn't your best. Yeah. And I appreciate the accountability and I feel totally open to talk or vent like when I need to. And I think that makes our dynamic and relationship special because we can you know be there for each other um but yeah it's not it's not all sunshine and rainbows <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard but no kidding. it's also like on the flip side it is amazing that we get to we get to do this together mm -hmm. um there's a lot of couples or people in relationships that they don't get to see their significant other for five or six months out of the year yeah which is so hard yeah and i get to travel with him um, so you take the good and the bad and, um, I think we're just fighting every day to do this as well as we can. Cause I would love to do this for the rest of my career. Mm -hmm. Um, but if it isn't realistic or if it isn't re the right fit anymore, we've talked about, you know, this, you know, potentially won't work forever, but I think, um, us having, so many conversations now trying to kind of get ahead of anything is, you know, the hope is making it last as long as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, uh, it's funny because I think, you know, if, when you kept Jordan as your coach mm -hmm. with Sarah, um, I think a lot of people would have assumed that it was like pretty much nepotism. Like, oh, it's like my husband. But like, if he was anything but the best coach for the job, you wouldn't have hired him because it's not like, <laughs> right? yes, this is going to be an easy dynamic. <laughs> no. <Yeah>, that, <laughs> like, <laughs> that, that's funny. We, we kind of joke around about that, like those comments, you know what I mean? Because it's like, <laughs> yeah. we're not doing it because it's easy and comfortable. Right. Right. And, uh, I, I told Kelly, I was like, hey, if I'm going to coach you, uh, it's because I believe I'm the best fit and it's because I believe I'm one of the best coaches out there. And it's, mm -hmm. believe, it's because I believe I can help you win a gold medal. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to sabotage my wife's career. <laughs> I'm not going to sabotage my own coaching career that I've worked really hard. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it's funny, like, I think people get a perception that's like, I'm not coaching like Pee Wee basketball, you know what I'm saying? Where <laughs> I have my son starting in the starting lineup and I'm telling every one of his teammates, 
to pass him the ball so he can score 30 points. Right. And at the end of the year, I'm like, oh, MVP goes to my son, you know. <laughs> and it's like, well, th- this, is our, this is our livelihoods. This is our right. careers. And in fact, it, the, the tension and troubles it causes, it, it's, it's hard. It's really yeah. hard. It, it presses and squeezes us a lot in our relationship. Mm-hmm. And there's constantly questions of like, is it worth it? Why are we doing mm-hmm. it? Uh, and so the only thing holding us together really is, I think, our faith background and a lot of similar values and, and, and dreams of um, who we want to become and why, why we're doing it. Yeah. yeah. It, uh, it's so funny because it's like, I can't imagine, like, me and Delaney, who do not coach each other, like, we can hardly talk about each other's volleyball matches. Like, we need to take some time. Like, if, I, if, if she played bad and she'd be like, what do you think? I'm like... Uh, it's a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the other way around, like she'll ask me, she'll be like, "Do you want my feedback?" And I'll be like, "Not yet." <laughs> yeah. but, like, we need you guys time can't to really cool off that. for sure. That's something I got work on. Yeah. When you asked, uh, like, I've never seen you guys get burnt out. When I go home, first thing I want to do is like watch film with Kelly. Right. And be like this play wasn't great. That play we gotta get better on. Yeah. This play was good. Right. And. In the marriage context, I get better about like, or I can't always talk about volleyball. Right. Um, Cause I I can do it all day. Yeah. All day. All day. <laughs> so I'll just go and watch film by myself in the corner and uh, not not say anything. And I'm but... cooking lunch. <laughs> He's like, "Come look at this." I said, "Not yet." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's hard, but I mean, I think to Kelly's credit, it, it it takes a very unique human being to have someone this close give her a lot of feedback. And I, I try to be good about, you know, complimenting and mm-hmm. encouragement. But also, I think the way I'm wired is very, like, I love, like, growth and development. And I think in order to grow and develop, you got to be challenged. You got to be squeezed a little bit. And right. you got to be aware. Mm-hmm. Aware of, you know, shortcomings. Aware of gifts and strengths and weaknesses and all that. And so uh, I, I'm probably the first one to challenge Kelly and call her out. Yeah. Uh, that's not always the you know the best, and that's part of the reason why we hired you know other coaches on staff. Right. I, I look at a lot of coaches that have won gold medals, and it seems like they have an army. Mm-hmm. And I remember telling Kelly, I was like, I, I need help. Like, I think I'm, I know I'm a great coach, and I, I believe I can help you win a gold medal. But I think it takes an army, and it helps some days just being like, all right, Goose, like, I'm so mad at Kelly right now, and. <laughs> I like, can't can look you, at her. Can you, can you, can you coach her? You know? Yeah. Uh, and again, I, I think Kelly gave a lot of credit to Sarah. And uh, I had the same conversation with Sarah. I'm like, hey, like, as humans, there's going to be some tension between Kelly and I and right. even you and me. And I think uh, just asking for a little grace there. And mm-hmm. I think the pros outweigh the cons. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't be coaching. Right. You know, I wouldn't, again, like, if I didn't believe I could add on more value than take away, then I wouldn't be doing it. Right. And I think that's also one of the things that makes you so good at what you do because like you can drop the ego and be like, you know what, maybe there are certain conversations that Gustavo might be the right one to have. Mm -hmm. And I I think that a lot of coaches, because like, I mean, it's notorious that the pay for head coaches of professional volleyball players is not the (laughs) highest and that they wouldn't want to give up a small of what is already a small piece of what's already a pretty small pie. But when you look at the federations that are winning a lot, I mean, Brazilian mm-hmm. teams have an army. I mean, Kai yep. Stam and Rice Schoon had like six coaches for themselves. Yeah. Yep. And I forget what tournament it was at Depema that I saw them. And I was like, wait, that's just for them? And I think that you guys are having so much success largely because you've built not just like a team of three, but you have like yep. a team of five when you include like Gustavo and Jake and whoever else is helping out. But I think Gustavo is also probably a valuable voice because like, if you're like, Gustavo, like, I need you to coach Kelly. And he could be like, Actually, I think maybe you need to calm down. <laughs> For sure. And Kelly might be in the right. For sure. <laughs> and having like, just like a neutral voice is probably really helpful. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, Goose yeah. has been such a breath of fresh air. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Goose and Jordan are very different. I think both very smart. Um, see the game similarly. Uh, but Goose just brings like a different life and energy to practice, yeah. which is so fun. And like him and... Jordan, just like, it's the yin and the yang, which is, Mm -hmm. it's so fun. Um, And I mean, I I get to see this because I live with Jordan, but every day when Goose drives home from practice or, you know, work at SC, 
He calls Jordan every day, and it doesn't matter what we're doing. We could be playing a board game or eating lunch or watching something. Jordan's like, oh, we're done with whatever we're doing. Goose is calling. (laughs) And off he goes to talk to Goose like he does every single day. And these two, oh, my gosh. Like, I just hear him laughing in the other room. These two just, like, talk for days. It's so fun. It's so fun to see them collaborating, working together, and... um, I just know, I I really get to see how much they care, how much work they put in, how much time they put in to making us the best that we can possibly be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I appreciate them both so much. It's it's a really cool and fun Mm -hmm. dynamic. Um, Yeah. It seems like your whole team just has a lot of fun. Just like when I was waiting to get our like last little serve and pass in yeah. and just like watching the dynamic between like you and goose playing against sarah and kelly and like a little bit of smack talk here it just seems like you guys have a lot of fun not in like the goofing off silly kind of fun but in like we're getting better like we're becoming one of the best teams in the world sort of fun i don't know it just seems like there's a lot of joy on that team i think that's that posture is where we are our best mm-hmm. um I think we've had days where we're all very serious. And at least for me, when I get too serious, I get too critical of myself. And then I think it's hard for me to receive feedback. It's hard for me to be a good teammate in those moments. Um, And I think that like kind of negative energy kind of emits out of me to like everyone else around me. So that's something I've been working on a lot, fighting hard to, you know, have a more joyful posture and having grace with myself. I think that's been kind of the biggest thing. I think when I don't give myself grace, that's when I fall into the trap of getting really frustrated. And then it ends up, I have like this mindset of, I have to be perfect. Mm -hmm. So when I do give myself grace, I think that's when I'm able to have that banter, but still get better and Mm -hmm. still have that fire and still um, be present and like bring my full self yeah um which i don't always do and it's it's tough every day like doing that but yeah i just think that's all of us at our best i think yeah isn't it like perfectionism and those high standards it's such a double-edged sword oh it's such a double because like sword. i think that you're one of the best blockers in the world because you have those standards for yourself Thanks. but then you also will like lose sleep over it because you have those standards for yourself. There's so much like, sleep, yeah. It's, it's just such a double-edged sword because that's why you're great and it's also like what drives people insane. Like yeah. the Michael Jordans yeah. and the Kobe's and like everyone who has ever gotten to that level, like that's one of those things that like it just eats them up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's hard. It's, it's, so like hard. A, it's like a weird blessing and a curse at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And I think I've for sure like let it get out of hand too much because the perfectionist mindset it's just it's not realistic and i think i did that a lot the last run mm-hmm. um and i really wasn't able to enjoy it um you know for i think a lot of reasons like the perfectionist mindset that last run um i think that forces games to feel like life or death um and even one singular point if it doesn't feel right even if i get the point it's hard for me to celebrate it yeah um so a lot of our conversation you know this next run has has been around you know celebrating the mini wins Mm -hmm. um because when we do the right things and have that foundation even if it doesn't work we're building that foundation and that's how we're going to grow that's how we're going to keep developing and once that foundation like really solidifies that's when we've been able to do some like really fun creative things which just fires me up even more because i i love all of that creative stuff i love thinking outside the box i love challenging how this game is played Mm -hmm. um but you've got to have that solid foundation first so yeah it's just it's it's just a long journey and like really fighting to enjoy every little bit of it which again i really don't think i did well on my last run it was so stressful i was like a ball of anxiety um it was really tough and yeah um 
I mean, we got there and like elated, obviously, for qualifying for the Olympics. But what it took to get there was like, oh my gosh, like I cannot do this for the rest of my life. Like, it's gnarly. I'm gonna <laughs> kill myself. It's, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah. So, yeah, I think because of all the conversations that we ha- have had and continue to have, um, I've enjoyed, I mean, it's not over yet, but I've enjoyed this, you know, run so much more. Mm-hmm. I think just because of the posture change, yeah. which has been cool. Yeah. And you yeah. have that perspective, mm-hmm. yeah, right? Because, totally. I mean, how much did it help when you, well, I guess, reframe it. What was it like when you got to the Olympics? You had all that anxiety for like a year and a half of trying right. to qualify for the Olympics, right? And it comes down to literally the dead last tournament. Mm-hmm. And you finally get there. Like, what was that moment like when you when you qualified and then when you got to the Olympics? I know it's kind of strange because Tokyo was a really weird yeah. Olympic it was experience a really weird Olympics. for everyone. Yeah. But I know, like, the, one of the most common things with athletes is that when they get to the mountaintop, they're like, oh, <laughs> like, that's it. And then they sort of are deflated. I'm curious what it was like for you guys throughout that journey. Yeah. My, my Olympic experience... It was obviously very different because of COVID, but mm-hmm. mine was extra different, I guess. Obviously, I-, I was so incredibly stoked to be there. And it was surreal walking around the village and every building has a huge flag of the country that lives in that, you mm-hmm. know, <laughs> building. And going to the mess hall and seeing all of these incredible athletes and just being starstruck over some were just like, knowing that I am around the best of the best. Yeah. Um, what was crazy for me was um, we'd been in the village for seven or eight days. And Sarah and I, or Sponsel and I, you know, we were dressed and ready to go to opening ceremonies. I was so stoked. Our first match wasn't the day after, so we were able to go to oh, opening nice. ceremonies. And I get a call before we walk downstairs, and I get told that I'm not allowed to walk. And... Uh, not only that, I am getting booted from the uh, village. Oh, I didn't know that you got that this happened to you too. Yeah, so Jake and I got booted the same day. Oh. So, yeah, like a few they sat, rows. They sat like four or five rows behind someone behind who tested someone... positive for you COVID. Were on the phone with someone who sat next to someone <laughs> whose friend had COVID. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, <laughs> I, I had to pack up. Um,. And Jake and I were taken out of the village the next morning. Oh. So for the rest of the Olympics, I sat in a hotel room by myself. Damn. So that was, it was pretty, that was pretty awful. And then, but I was thankful that we were still able to compete. Mm -hmm. And then, oh my gosh, we, I had like a private driver that would take me to practice. So this was like maybe the second day of my extra quarantine Um, (laughs) driving to practice. I had to go in like a super secret back entrance (laughs) and I'm going through the security there and nobody speaks English. And there's like the one security guy and there's like five Japanese police officers with these huge guns. And this guy checking me in has a sheet of paper with my picture has Sarah Sponsel's name next to it, and it says, has COVID. And he's like, he like looks at it and then looks at me and then looks at it. He's like, go sit over there. And my phone wasn't working, of course. And I'm sitting there for, I think I sat there for 20 minutes. And for the first 15 minutes, I like kept it together. I'm like, it's a mistake. We're going to be okay. Like, I don't know what's going on. Don't freak out yet because you don't know what's going on. Right. And then... It was just too much time sitting there. It was like at the 20 minute mark, I just started bawling. I was just like, my Olympic dream is over. Yeah. We're not going to get to compete. I'm going to have to, I'm not going to have to do what Taylor did, sit in a hotel room by myself for 14 days and then get sent home. Yeah. Um, which I, I can't imagine how Taylor felt about all of that. Um, and then the, uh, some some guy like running that facility came in, looked at the sheet, and he like waved no to the guy. He's like, "Come on, I'll take you to your court. You're good. Go practice." <laughs> <That's crazy. laughs> what? So it's just it was a wild emotional roller coaster that I felt like a lot of it didn't need to happen. Yeah. Um. So 
it wasn't the best. I'm very thankful for my experience. And even with all of that adversity, I loved, I loved getting to fight there with Sponsel. I think we should have done better, but you know, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm, I really want to fight for (laughs) a normal Olympic experience. I've talked to so many Olympians and it's one of the most amazing places and experiences that they've ever gotten to go and do. Like you get to go represent your country in front of the entire world against the best of the best. And I've, I've always wanted to go watch other (laughs) athletes do their craft, you know, against the best. And, Mm -hmm. and, you know, we didn't get to go, nobody was allowed to go watch other matches. Mm -hmm. So I'm hopeful that we will qualify for Paris and, um, and get like a normal experience Yeah, and, you know, fight for a gold medal. That's like, it's cool to think about that. I, I believe that we, we can do that, you know? Yeah. Is yeah. it so cool, like, just to think about how, like, you have become one of the best in the world at what you do? And actually, I want to read you something from this book. Oh, goodness. <laughs> I think I sent it to you when I was writing it. Um, where, because your first interview on this podcast, I want to say, was, like, 2017. Oh, um, I remember it. Yeah. We're not there yet, Trav. And I have you in here as Kelly Chang. I couldn't remember <laughs> if funny. I kept you as Clay's because when you did the interview, you were Clay's. I was Clay's yeah. Um, let's see. He said, "Is this realistic?" He said, "I just know for me. I don't know if this is realistic, but hey, dream big. I want to be the best blocker in the world. That's my goal. I don't know if it's going to be the next year or the next year, but I'm going to work my butt off at it, and I want to be the best at it. I think it's possible. And here we are. You're one of the best blockers in the world. We're I think, getting there. I think one up. We're getting there. What for do you sure. think?" Uh, who do you think are the best blockers in the world right now? I'm curious in your opinion. Because my, my list would be... Brandy. You, Brandy, Anna Patricia, yeah, Taryn. I think Katya would have been on that list for a while, but they're like I don't, they're just not playing as good as they can. Yeah, they're when they're, at their, when they're at their best, I think yeah. Katya's in that conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tanya Huberly's... I'm the littlest blocking. on that list. Are you? I think so. Isn't it crazy like how big the women's game is getting? I feel so little up there. <laughs> And you're what, 6'2", 6'3"? 6'1". Oh, six, all right. 6'5", six, it is. 6'5", <laughs> yeah. yeah. This, is not my, this is not my indoor roster size, yeah. which I always wrote like 6'3". I'm 6'1 yeah. and some change. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I feel, I feel so little up there sometimes. <laughs> when I get OT'd sometimes, I'm like, sorry, sir. Who OT's you? <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, I think Anna Brandy. Patricia. Sometimes, oh, Brandy. yeah. Brandy sometimes OT's me. I'm like, so rude. <laughs> So rude, Brandy. <laughs> All right, so I, yeah, Brandy. Can do that. What's crazy is that Brandy's like what five ten, something like that. Yeah, she just flies. Yeah, like it's nuts. Yeah. That she's girl's springy. She's long got arms. long arms. She's yeah. got the nails as well. Yeah, it's all extra inches. We talked about the nails. Oh when yeah, we you, had guys her nail on. you guys did. You guys did. And funny. Trav was like, "You can't wear those while you play." She's like, "Oh yeah." I don't she's know like, how I'm she... learning how to handset. I was like, wait, you handset with the claws? <laughs> <laughs> Who asked her that? Who handsets with their fingertips like that? <laughs> but like you would think that, I mean, if they're curved, like it would get in the way. I don't know. I just, I'd have trouble with how it. How do you handset, Trav? <laughs> I mean, I like get full balls in there, but like. Full balls in there? <laughs> yeah. You hold it. I don't know. I mean, Rosie and Jake, they do like. The oh, yeah, yeah. Fingers. They're like. I don't know if they could do it. They're like, screw these other fingers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I need full contact. <laughs> <laughs> but when we did that first interview, I think you were on your way up, but still well outside the conversation of best in the world. And now five years later, or six years, however long that it's been, mm-hmm. you're certainly in that conversation. What do you think has it helped you get there? Like, what's that process been like? Oh, gosh. I would not put myself up there yet. Uh, okay. I still think blocking is one of my weakest skills um and it's something that i'm diving into a lot just watching trying to watch a lot of film i'm getting out with jake and his a few of his uh 14 year olds (laughs) come out we just (laughs) working on eye work and working on independent arms and just diving into blocking together which has been super fun Mm -hmm. um but yeah i think i mean even andy has sat down with me and talked about blocking like 
I'm really appreciative for all the people who have been willing to like sit down and chat with me about yeah. it. Obviously, I've talked a lot about blocking with Jordan too. Um, yeah, I think I think watching film has has helped a lot. Um, I think understanding my strengths and weaknesses as a blocker, like I can't touch what you know someone like Brandy can touch, but I'm quick and I can do my best to convince you to hit where I want you to hit you, mm -hmm. where I want you to hit. Um, so yeah, I just, I think it's that, that cat and mouse game, um, which is fun at times and very frustrating at times. Yeah. So still, still learning, still trying to get better, still have that goal on the vision board <laughs> Yeah. for sure. Because I think one thing that I think you have done as a player and with your teams is that you've been sort of at the cutting edge of how the women's game is changing Thanks. where you and Sponsor, and I want to say that, that a big part of that is probably Tyler Hildebrand and his coaching because yeah. I know that he was huge on the option game before it was as big as it is now mm -hmm. and that you and Sarah Sponsor optioned more than any team in the world with a super high efficiency rate yeah. and the way you block I think only you and Brandy block the way you guys do, where you make those big outside the body moves that you really only see from the men. Yeah. And now you're throwing in some jump sets. And you guys are you are Ooh, hand setting for you know? We're jump setting now. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> so like I love it. You're not afraid to like tinker and add things that no one else is doing. Yeah. And then I think that like you're often the standard setter where you do something and everyone's like, Oh, that that's working. We should probably do that. <laughs> like it's, that's hard it's fun yeah i think i think i've always here's like the box that the game is played in i think mm -hmm. i've always like gone outside the box and just seen what's up um i remember playing in at oh the 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 queen of the court or the king of the court used to they had a few events after avp hawaii yeah i think a few years in a row i think i was playing with brit at the time and there was one round i Britt and I were on... That's Britt uh, Hochevar. Ho Hochevar, yeah. Uh, we were on the queen side almost the entire round, and I, I went over on one almost half the time. Like, because <laughs> queen... So disrespectful. This, this format is like everybody's bombing serves. Right. And, like, when... If whoever's serving at me is serving line to line, like, I, I was just bumping over to, like, area... What is that? One, two, three. Like, four or five. Yeah. And nobody's touching it. I did it quite a few times in that round or and then they'd serve Brit and I'd option it's yeah. just like I think it's fun to like explore and tinker um and for sure there's times where it's gone awry or it's or it's too much like I was optioning with Brit a lot mm -hmm. um we didn't have like much of a system around it so it's just like whenever I felt like it I'd go up and whack the ball you know yeah. and I think with Sponsor, we created a system, um, and that I think that was fun for both of us to kind of work through, you know, that system together. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's fun. It's fun to, like, learn new things and add new things. I feel like Sarah mm -hmm. Hughes, and I think Sponsor, obviously, because you guys added it, but I feel like Sarah Hughes, like, you'd be like, listen, if you bicycle kicked every set, we'd win. She'd be like, oh, yeah, let's do it. Let's bicycle <laughs> kick. Like she's just like whatever yeah. would help you guys win. I feel like she's just like totally all in. I've had a few. Um, we've been working on the jump set, mm -hmm. and I've had a few jump, poke sets. Oh, all right. And and Jordan's been like, stop. <laughs> this is not realistic. And I've had a few really good ones. And Sarah's like, semi. <laughs> like I'll hit that. Yeah. <laughs> she's all in. <laughs> I'm like, my girl, let's do Jordan's this. Jordan's covering his eyes. Jordan's like, stop doing this to me. It reminds me of like that, the one player where like Steph Curry, who's like dribbling in between his legs, and then like he has three guys on him, does a fadeaway three from three feet away, and Steve Kerr's like, what are you doing? And then he switches it, and he's yeah. like, I can't believe it. And so I think, <laughs> I think my, my job as a coach, let it be known, like, I'm all for creativity. Yeah. Well, I'm also for repeatability and what's the same, yeah. right? And so it's funny in Chicago, she did a jump set, and it's kind of like a kind of a freak out. And I think uh, she ended up poking it, and she poked it right to the ref. 
<laughs> and it was this, it was this air in a game, and my reaction was like, "Oh my gosh! Like I can't believe she just did that." Yeah. But on the flip side, it's like, what a beautiful thing that she is willing to experiment in a game and have, I guess, the courage to try it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you look at Annie and Miles, who I think has grown faster than any team on the world tour oh, this year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and why? Like, how many critics were there when they're jump setting from ten feet off, fifteen feet off? Mm-hmm. But this is a cha- like in challenger events for Olympic qualifying points. Yeah, they made a decision like, hey, we're gonna be curious about this. We're gonna try to do this because we think this is how it gives us an edge. And they jump set almost every ball. Yep. And here they are, you know, as one of the best teams in the world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so with with Sponsel and Kelly, you know, is unique experience because I came in kind of halfway through season. Yeah. Right. And uh, what I love to do as a coach is look at the players and be like, all right. I have Sponsel, I have Kelly, what are the strengths, what are the competitive advantages that we can have as a team? And they're telling me their goal is to win a gold medal. I'm like, all right, we're not on track yet. You know, and looking at, like, say, our hitting percentages, uh, it's not demonstrating any championship behavior. So how do we do that in less than a year? Yeah. It's like, well, Sponsel is one of the best passers in the world. Yeah. And I think Kelly's one of the best option hitters in the world. And... So it's like, let's try to create a system where I think that can give us a competitive advantage. Uh, and let's study other teams, what they're doing well. And not many teams are doing it right. Um, but let's figure out how we can do it well. Mm-hmm. And I think that helped us, you know, qualify for Olympics. Yeah. Um, but it's funny because on the way to qualifying, everyone and their mothers hated it. And it's like, I, Kelly options too much. She does this. She does that. Uh, even the announcers, you know, it's like, well, I'm looking at the stats. I'm like, wait a second. She just hit 600 on the option. Uh, I think that's good enough. Like, call me crazy, but <laughs> yeah. I think it's good enough. And sure, there's a balance. I think the next progression for Kelly is, you know, stats don't tell the full picture. Mm-hmm. And Kelly can go six for seven on the option in the first set. But then, you know, it's 20 all. Um, and say Kelly's getting... Uh, Kelly has an option and it doesn't go down. Like that carries a little bit more weight right. than having the first couple option kills at you know two, three, or three. Which, all. Do you think that it should? Uh, yes and no. It, I know that doesn't maybe answer your question yeah. fully, but I think there, as you get older and get a better feel for the game, I think hopefully decision making can uh, get better in what we call like the red zone. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um. Or even like, uh, say Kelly's getting served every ball. Yeah. And then finally, you know, Sarah gets a dig and then Kelly options. Sometimes I'm like, even if Kelly gets the option kill, uh, I'm trying to remind Kelly, and this is my belief, it's not black and white and I don't, it's not necessarily right or wrong, but I think sometimes it's worth more getting your partner involved. Yeah. Because you're getting served every ball. So let her help carry some weight for the team. You yeah. know what I mean? So stuff like that is, I think, what we're trying to navigate right now mm-hmm. as effective as she can be with optioning um it's so hard when you're getting served every ball though because you're in such a like a yeah. offensive frame of mind mm-hmm. we're like now everything's just an opportunity yeah. i remember when i was playing hermosa with jd and i was optioning everything i was feeling pretty good and then i took one from like 16 feet out, like <laughs> way off and jd was like it's all right bro <laughs> you can like, set me and i was like you're right <laughs> I pumped the brakes yeah. but i had it <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but I saw something yeah, and I went like, for it's it. Like, it's like, I saw a six inch opening. I could have hit it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just funny that when you get in that offensive frame of mind, sometimes it's hard to turn off and you're like, oh yeah, maybe setting my partner for the first time in 15 <laughs> minutes would have been a good idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a but balance, yeah. The, I think the option decision making is easily the most underrated parts of option because anyone mm-hmm. can hit a ball on two, mm-hmm. but it's like the decision between angle and line and pace and when to actually hit the option yeah. is that because you did you option a lot at sc too or is that like something that you sort of picked up with sarah uh, or with brit a little bit at sc um not that much uh, more more starting with brit yeah yeah is it what do you think you've grown more in the decision making of when and where to hit it or the physicality of hitting it in the right spot at the right time uh, it's, it's like they're hand in hand. Probably so. the decision making yeah. and like feeling kind of the flow of the match and like what's going on. Um, like I think my cutback pokey is super effective mm-hmm. and it 
and especially with a team that knows it's coming, it's like it can go down, but you have to wait for like the right time. Right. And kind of be like pick and choosy about it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that's gotten better. Um, For sure, I'm more physical than I was like right out of college. Right. Um, I could still bang the ball out of college. (laughs) But probably, probably. You got heat now though. Holy moly. I got good heat. (laughs) I got more in the tank. (laughs) It's fun to hit the ball hard. (laughs) Yeah. Jordy, I think the way you were explaining sort of the a lot of the criticisms that mm-hmm. Kelly would get about the optioning, I think is a pattern I've noticed is that I think you have, a, if I were to make an award for most unfairly criticized player in the world, you're like the leader <laughs> by like a thousand. <laughs> I don't understand. It's like you and then maybe Taryn is <laughs> is up there as well because she gets called on probably more lifts, like between her, her mm. and Julia and Sarah Sponsor, I think, are like yeah. the three leaders in lifts. But yeah. everyone's just like... People give you a hard time, and I'm trying to understand. Like, why do you guys think that Kel gets so much heat? Is it the red hair? <laughs> Just the red hair. Goodness. <laughs> you got any thoughts? <laughs> you can go. It's, it's funny we we talk we talk about this a little bit uh, throughout this podcast. Like, the word self awareness keeps popping up. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's in, it's really important to me as a husband, as a coach. Uh, you know, takes a lot of self-awareness. If we're going to be a husband-wife, coach-player relationship, we got to have a lot of self-awareness right. of how that impacts those around us. Um, you know, Kelly talking about what she's working on and how she's so critical of herself. And you brought, like, the perfectionist side. Mm-hmm. So you got to have a lot of self-awareness. The perfectionist is what makes her her and right. brought her to this level. But I think we're working on making that voice instead of a 10 out of 10, kind of like a 3 out of 10. Because mm-hmm. you say, hey, get rid of it. Because perfection's bad. Then that doesn't make her her, right? Right. But then we got to be self-aware. She's got to be self-aware of how that like affects a, others like around her. tipping point. Yeah. yeah. And so I say all that because I, I think my guess why, you know, there's some gnarly comments like uh, on YouTube, like we'll lose a match. And I read a comment. There's like, oh, I don't care who won as long as it's not Kelly Chang. Right. And I'm like... That person's filled with like a lot of hatred, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> right. I've never for one person, you know, it doesn't matter who wins, but Kelly Chang. And, and so I, I have some guesses, you know, and uh we're very different people. And so like when I first started coaching Kelly, you know, I brought uh there's an example I, I've told her where like I'm serving her some balls and there's a ball that dropped like a foot in front of her and she didn't go for it. And I'm like, Kelly, like, what will happen? And she's like, I I couldn't get it. I'm like, no, all you had to do was like, go for it, you know, try it. Like, <laughs> surely you could have gone. Yeah. Uh, and then you, you ask her a little more questions and you press in a little bit. And it's like, well, you know, I saw it late. I took a negative step backwards. And but by the time, and I was mad at myself for taking that negative step backwards. And then, so I just didn't think I could get it anymore. And I'm like, if you're an innocent bystander or fan just walking by and you see that play, it's like, oh, Kelly's lazy. She's not trying hard. Right. And I think there's a certain persona with, the way she thinks about things. Uh, And I think that's why she's a little misunderstood. Um, And it's like, well, again, if you ask questions, you you understand why it looks the way it looks. And, you know, something that I I got frustrated with her in Chicago, she had a jump set against Taryn and Kristen. And great decision, Taryn bit, Sarah had an open net, she said over the net. Uh, And Kelly's mad at herself, still mad at herself that she said over, and she thought the ref was going to call a lift. And if you go yeah. watch the play, she's just walking back and plays over. Yeah. I'm like, ref didn't blow the whistle. Like, keep playing. <laughs> they did not call a lift. And I'm like, we got to keep playing, Kelly. And I, so I'm, I'm frustrated with her. Yeah. And there's that perfectionist side. And I'm like, that can't, that can't come out during a game. Right. Even in practice, I, I think we can't allow that voice to consume. Mm-hmm. Right. And so my guess is that I think people see that and then they're just like, I don't like this girl. Like she doesn't care. She doesn't try hard. And it's like, you just, you know, I I think people, the people that know you the least oftentimes have the most to say about you. Oh yeah. And the strongest opinions. Yes. And the strongest opinions. And and so something that, you know, (laughs) at this level that Kelly has to constantly navigate is like those people don't have permission uh, to speak into your life. They don't have any weight behind what they say. Right. You know, they're not in it with you. If there's a person grinding with you and they're there, like, 
maybe a little bit more weight, right? Mm-hmm. But those people don't have weight. And, uh, you know, so just trying to figure out how to um, get that perfectionist side, tone it down a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I, I think a lot of it is just a misunderstanding. But to say she's, you know, not a hard worker or she doesn't try hard, it's like, well, we let, let's take a step back. Not because I'm the husband, but let's objectively try to look right. at things. You know what I mean? Like a two-hour practice. Then we have a team meeting, a film session uh, for an hour and a half. How many teams are doing that? I, I'm not sure a lot. And then she goes to PT for two hours. And then she goes to, you know, her lift. Yeah. And then sometimes even mobility. That's a full day. Yeah. And then on top of that, she might get an hour of reps with Jay Gibb and his kids. Right. And I'm like, I think that's a good demonstration of hard work and someone that cares. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And, and so uh, just the way it's communicated sometimes is different. And I think people don't like different. Just like the same thing as options is right. different. Standing and poking, no one's giving Miles Partain crap for optioning. No. Not, not one person. But when Kelly stand and pokes, it's different. Yeah. And it doesn't look like she's as in it or, yeah, I, I don't know. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and so it's just, it's like, who are those people speaking to your life? Do you know them? Do they know you? Then, mm-hmm. you know, we, we, I don't think they have permission to speak into your life. Yeah. Well, yeah. I feel like uh, I said Taryn was probably your second. I think Anna Patricia, you and Anna Patricia are number one and two for probably <laughs> most unfairly criticized players, which is hilarious because the number one and two ranked teams in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. La la la. la, la, la. Right. Does it, uh, like, do you let that stuff bother you? Hmm. Oh, great question. Um, so I think, I think I've heard people have not liked how I've played since college. <laughs> I've like, I've heard it almost my entire career. Yeah. And it's been a challenge for me cuz i i've let it affect me for a really long time yeah and it's really hard for me not to um like seeing comments online you know youtube or instagram or anything um it it eats away at me um and it's it's really ho- with social media it's hard to you know ignore it um but I've I've been fighting really hard the last year and a half to kind of shut that out, because um, I I love the way I play, and I love getting to do what I get to do, and I I love the quote that Jordan says because those people don't know me, um, and for whatever reason they have a very strong opinion of me. Yeah. Um. And I can't please everybody, and I'm not going to change the way I play to please anybody. Um, so I think it's just kind of trying to stay in my lane, and that lane kind of goes where you know I want it to go, and kind of ignoring the outside voices. Because, yeah, there's been, there's been days I think Jordan has come home, I'm just like crying in my room because I read some comments which I shouldn't have been sitting there reading them, but... But the temptation's hard. The temptation's yeah. hard. It's really hard. It's really hard. It's really hard not to read them. Um, and it's really hard not to take them to heart. <laughs> yeah. But they don't They don't know what we're doing or... Yeah, like, I'm, I'm sure every athlete has dealt with it, but, like, I lose a match, I've gotten death threats. And I don't know if people have, like, bet on those matches, but it's like oh, you threw that game, like, I hope you go die in hell. It's just like, whoa, like, yeah. it's it's crazy. <laughs> Something like, like I'm super passionate about, uh, the idea of kind of like self-worth, right? Yeah. And it's an honor and like joy for me to uh, be able to help walk Kelly through that, I think. And, you know, when I first met her, one, th- one of the things we talked about is there's always going to be someone that doesn't see uh your own worth or there's always gonna be someone that doesn't see your worth Mm -hmm. don't let it be you You i mean there's always going to be someone and and so you know i think through life experiences and college experience or whatever you know i I think uh self-worth was a big thing coming into like coaching her and even all all the players i coach and i think especially for for girls uh you know and uh another thing we talk about just like if you live for like people's approval, you're also going to die 
to their rejection. Right. You know what I mean? Good morning. Here at Sandcast, you know, we got to keep our minds, bodies on point all the time. So we like to start our days with a little AG1. A little water in there. Give her a little spinneroo. And we're good to go. Multivitamins, all the goods your body can need, the greens, all in one. This is all you need, AG1. Now after we get our athletic greens, we're all energized to go practice with the only ball that we're ever going to use. Wilson, baby. And after practice, obviously, I'm sweating a ton. I need to get rehydrated. The only way we're doing it at Sandcast is with Waikia Volcanic Water, with bottles made of 100% ocean plastic. We're getting hydrated. We're saving the environment one bottle at a time, baby. Cheers. Guys, after a long day, you know, we're in the sun out there grinding and playing. We got the sunset going down, and we just need the perfect drink to take us into a nice evening of podcasting. And this is what we choose. Bartender in a box. My favorite flavor, the Mai Tai, but we also have margarita as a awesome choice. And uh, you know, there's 12 drinks, 12 cocktails in just one tasty box. It comes with the spout on it as well. So boom, sit down at the beach, take it on the go, 12 cocktails. Bartender in a box, it is the official beverage of the Sandcast podcast. You know, and so, you know, mentioned earlier, like, the thing that's kind of holding us together is, like, our our why, like, why we do it, you know, and uh, we, we get a dream together about, like, what we get to do. Mm -hmm. um, and we, I guess we can talk more about that now or later, but it's something that helps us, like, it reminds us, you know, like, you get torn down. You're like, well, why am I doing this? Who am I doing it for? Like, who do I want to become? And it's worth, in my opinion, pushing through that stuff yeah. to get there versus getting beat up like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's this great, I guess, essay. I think Paul Graham wrote it on fanboys and haters. Mm -hmm. And he talks about it both. And he's like, at the end of the day, you need to look at them both as the same. Where no matter yeah. what you do, your fanboys are going to be like, you're the best. Like, go for it. And on the other hand, no matter what you do, your haters are going to be like, you suck. Like, yeah. And you're like, you just have to take them both for what they are. Yeah. You can't really let them affect you. But if, I don't know. If, have you read The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck? Yeah. Life-changing. It's really good. <laughs> Loved it. It's really good. Just because like, with like writing, obviously what I do with like, the podcast, commenting, whatever, like, everything I've done has been a pretty public hmm. work. Yeah, you're right. And especially good point. Man, when I covered uh, the 2018 Olympics for Yahoo!, and each story gets like two million reads. Hmm. Like, well, and the first rule our editors, when we were onboarding, they were like, don't go to the comments. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I remember. Did you? So I wrote this story on how the U.S. women outmeddled the men. It was like the first time they'd done that in a Winter Olympics in a while. And it wasn't like pitting the women against the men. It's just like, oh, this is what happened. Like cool and they were like this is the type of leftist anti-trump <laughs> bullshit all this stuff like the world's gone woke and i was like you know i probably vote the same way you do <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like and it just meant like the comment section or like you know the youtube chats or whatever it may be like it's all it's all the same like you can't yeah. you just can't yeah. put any stake into it and it's so hard yeah mm -hmm. because you hear you like read it you're like damn like, that's yeah. a strong opinion well again it puts <laughs> so it puts tension on our marriage too right and that's something we talked about too before getting into this of like hey like just know because we're married like that's going to be one of the biggest causes for blame oftentimes i think the scapegoat mm -hmm. and it takes self-awareness like if i'm actually a bad coach and putting this team a lot lower than where they should be then that i gotta be self-aware to like either get better or get out mm -hmm. right uh but again it's like if kelly doesn't do well it's because now she's married to her coach right her, her you know her husband mm -hmm. and that, that's toxic. Uh, that's a toxic relationship. If Sarah doesn't do well in the game, well, it's because how could she? Mm -hmm. She's she's playing with her partner, whose uh, husband is the coach. Right. And it's like, dang, like, I feel like we've done pretty well. Yes, our standards that gold medal and we're chasing that, but I think right. we've done fairly well this year. And to get I'd our first so. to get our first ninth, <laughs> and then to now have all these, like you said, these people flip, and you know, the first things are marriage, uh, and so and and like that ninth. You know, this is just the fickle nature of sports. Like, you had the match in hand. Yeah. I we're mean, up, I know we're up eight four in the third. Yeah, uh, and, and this and isn't yeah, this isn't the reason why we lost. But uh, you talked about like sponsor Taren and uh, 
Julia getting called lifts. Yeah. I, I think the entire USA Federation gets called, because uh, yeah. Kelly gets called a few, I, I few times. Is It's not like, because a couple coaches wanted to be like, we need to go to the like FIVB and talk about it, like this anti-American. I'm like, well, I think we just need to teach our girls to start yeah. setting a little higher, because we are... American women are distinctly yeah. lower. I agree, level. and I, I think they can, if they're going to change the rule, do it in the off season where yes. you have some time. Yes. Versus, it seems like every other tournament's flipping and flopping. Yeah. But anyways, like to your point, yeah, it was a very close match that we lost in the ninth yeah. place round to Brandy and Mel. Yeah. One and of the best teams in the world who ended up winning. And like an yeah. angle swing goes down, the whole yeah. narrative coming <laughs> out of that tournament is shifted. Yeah. And For like sure. Mel and Brandy, like you know, crazy run. Mm -hmm. Like Betsy and Julia had no business beating Anna Patricia yeah. and do it. And then they yeah. make that run to the that finals. Game was crazy. You know, it was crazy. nuts. Like I've never seen anything like that. Yeah. So like that's the fickle nature of sports where and like you guys had that same situation in Stodd where you were down eight four in the third. Yeah. You come back right. and it's a totally different story. Mm -hmm. Right. And so yeah, I think it's uh it's hard for people who have not been in it to understand like how quickly a narrative or script can change mm -hmm. they're just they just like see the results yeah and that's all they they don't see it like eight four match you get called on a weird lift at a weird time that wasn't a lift right <laughs> I, I just i watched it back it's the same as all of my other sets yeah it's just that's what's frustrating is when it's it's literally exactly the same yeah and i love the <sighs> and i love the way you asked one i love Every tournament should mic up the ref stand because here being able to hear the conversation is <laughs> mm -hmm. awesome, yeah. especially when it's a guy and they're just like chewing the refs out. I yeah. love those. But you were just like, how is that different than what we've done for the last hour? Yes. <laughs> like, and it and was no I, I hate, I hate when refs won't have the conversation. Like she just shooed me away. I'm just like, just have the conversation with yeah. me. Like. It's not just about you up on your pedestal, like what I say goes. Like, it's just, it's tough. Yeah. There's some refs <laughs> that just give you the hand and then card you. And then yeah. there's some that, some that will have the conversation. And I really appreciate those refs because mm -hmm. now we're on, we're on the same page because setting is subjective. Mm -hmm. uh, you can, I mean, watch a whole tournament, like each ref is going to call it a little bit different. Um, but having those conversations, like I've, there's a few older, more, I, in my opinion, more experienced refs that they'll, in the middle of the match, like I'm on the side switch and he's like, Kelly, that last set was on the line. And then the rest of the match, I'm going a little bit faster. He's like, beautiful, no problem. Now, hmm. cool. now you don't have to make calls that change the shift of the match. Right. Like the game should not be won and lost on like a, a lift or a double call unless it's like, you're like falling backwards and like right. <laughs> chucking it's it. It's like a clear chuck. Yeah, yeah, it's just it's tough for game. Yeah, there's there's been a handful of games since this rule change that have been like won or lost on that. It's just like ah, this is just not. It's not entertaining to watch. Like, it's not good for the players. It's not good. It's not good for anybody. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's tough. tough as a commentator. I'm like. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> I don't want to bash the ref right now, but. <laughs> But, ooh, trying I mean, hard, it's not a great call. <laughs> <laughs> uh, say but lovey. you mentioned that like you've been criticized since college. Um, what's funny is that you leave college as you and Sarah are the winningest players of all time in college. Kristen has the NCAA distinction. You guys have the call it. Like no one's won as many matches as you have. Like you're criticized up through the Olympics with Sarah, youngest team in United <laughs> States Olympic history criticized for whatever reason with the new Sarah, the old but new Sarah. Old but new. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys are one of the best teams in the world. So I think that like the only real opinion that matters is like your opinion of yourselves and your teams and like the results are undeniable. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I just think the way you guys carry yourselves is undeniable. I'm happy to be your friend. <laughs> <laughs> Love you too. <laughs> but with this upcoming stretch like, what does the season look like now? Like, are you just, are you adding new wrinkles? Because it's hard to add wrinkles right now. There's no real yeah. off season to add stuff. Because now, like, as you said, like, Kelly's jump poke setting in matches. But like, there's no real time right now yeah. to tinker. Yeah. And so, like, are we just, just going for it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, you guys will see. Uh, we're, we made a few adjustments. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the good thing about... You know, getting a ninth and fifth back to back is one like these girls are so hungry, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're they're willing to put in the work and 
they know the level they're able to play at. Uh, so we're trying to make adjustments. You know, teams are pulling on Sarah Hughes a little bit more, um, and we got to get our block defense better. And so those are kind of like the focuses. Um, now, how much is going to change in two weeks of training? I'm not sure, but uh, I think uh, we're, we're speeding up the offense a little bit, and mm-hmm. I think that's going to help. Yeah. yeah. And I wanted to cover uh, one more thing, and then we got dinner with Mama D, <laughs> Baby A. Um, you mentioned faith is sort of a, a pretty strong foundation of both like you guys as a, as a team and as a family. And Kelly, you mentioned something I'd never heard you say before that uh, in Sochi, where you're like, like the breakthroughs now. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm wondering, because God speaks to different people in, in different ways. Mm-hmm. And what, like, what was that like? Was it like a clear, like, was it like a voice? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. There's been a few times in my life that he's, I've heard him speak. Mm-hmm. And then there's been seasons of my life that he talks to me through music. Okay. Which has been like. Like music that you're playing, singing, or like listening to? Um, I will just be in the middle of something and like a piece of a song will pop into my head. Yeah. And it's, it's more than just like me singing a song to myself. It's like out of the blue. It's not a song I've heard in a while. And it's like so distinct. Mm hmm. And I'll stop what I'm doing and I'll look up the lyrics and always without a doubt, like I needed to hear those lyrics. So like, that's been, that's been really cool. Yeah. That is super <laughs> I cool. I love my relationship with him. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Is, and is that something that, cause it, as I've known you for a little while and like we've gotten closer as the years have gone on, but it, it seems to me like your faith has grown a lot over the years. Yeah. Or has that like always been like a pretty big part of your life? Yeah, I grew up a Christian, um, and then I think, I think through high school and most of college, I kind of had the attitude of like, I don't need God, like I can do this on my own, mm-hmm. and I've had a lot of pitfalls through my life, um, and I'm a very stubborn person, so I feel like I throughout the very stubborn <laughs> throughout the course of that time of my life. Um, I had to go through like the same thing kind of over and over again. Um, and because I'm very stubborn. Um, so it kind of, yeah, I guess, I guess it took, you know, falling on my face enough times to be like, okay, I can't do this on my own anymore. And, um, I think this was when I was playing with Brit and, um, Britt's a Christian and we had mm-hmm. a lot of, you know, really cool conversations together. And I think that year I, I told myself, I was living at my parents' house in Fullerton, driving to Hermosa every day. And I was Jeez. like, yeah. <laughs> um, I told myself, I'm going to pray in the car every day. Like for that, well, traffic, it's 45 Yeah. with traffic. It's much longer. Um, and for the first, I'd say four months I I couldn't even muster up the courage to pray to him I just felt so unworthy and so ashamed of all of my sins Mm -hmm. um and I just like I'd sit in the car and just some days cry (laughs) sometimes just sit there silently just like trying to work up the nerve to sit there and pray and um, that year, it was tough, but I, I got to a point where I'm, it was every day sitting in the car, talking to him like he was sitting in my passenger seat. And that, that was like the first year I started, the music thing kind of started, um, where he just started giving me songs all the time. Um, and I think that's around the time I kind of like had the realization of like, ooh, I don't, I don't think I have any self-worth. And I think that's why it's been so challenging for me. Like the criticism of people, um, like just unable to pray, like, and you know, lots of other things in my life. Um, so it's for sure been a journey for me. Um, and on top of me, like learning and, growing my relationship with God, I met someone who is a very strong Christian and, I mean, is now our spiritual leader of our family. 
and has really that's right that's oh right. my gosh all right and 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 now i'm done complimenting him because he ruins it oh my gosh why do you have to ruin everything <laughs> um i don't even know what i say anymore you're the worst <laughs> I, uh, yeah, you, if i if i can add on yeah the the faith aspect i mean i know this is a volleyball podcast right but the faith aspect is huge and i think there's a certain way like of how we want to go about things right and one of the first things i think of is you know when kelly's sharing like oh the breakthrough is now and like kind of like god being able to speak to her through that i remember vividly in our last olympics in tokyo you know kelly's 25 i think sponsor's 24 mm -hmm. and we beat rebecca and anna patricia mm -hmm. and that helped us win pool and this moment of like wow we just won pool how crazy is that? One of the youngest teams out there. Yeah. And I was sitting next to Tyler, Tyler Hildrand, and I was just sitting there, and there's something in my gut that just, like, wasn't at peace with something. And I'm like, Tyler, like, can I can I talk to you really quick? I was, like, really proud of the girls. Like, it's unbelievable. We won in three, uh, like, really good fight, and, and they pulled out a victory against a very good team. But I just didn't think they were the best teammates. And I think that's where, like, you know, maybe the faith aspect comes in, where it's, like, there's – values and things that are important to us and i remember telling the girls this in our debrief after the match and they they weren't happy with my response which, which understandably so you yeah. use one pool and your coach is saying good job but i think we could have been better teammates yeah and you know i can't i can't talk about sponsor because i'm not a coach anymore but to like kelly like if we if we were to go back and watch that game in between points like no eye contact you know there's uh just going back to uh her spot no high fives like a big deal for, for me and how I coach and how I want us to be able to make this push into Paris is this unified push, you know, being great teammates. And I didn't think at the time, being that young, that we could have won a gold medal without being great teammates. Mm -hmm. Now, do you have to be great teammates to win a gold medal? No, there's plenty of examples. I'm not, I don't need to say names, but there's plenty of examples of players out there that can win right. without being great teammates. But it's important to, I think, us. Uh, and the faith aspect plays a big part of that. And... Again, we said earlier, like, we get a dream together, and uh, why we want to go to the Olympics and win a gold medal, it's, uh, I think it, it gives us this platform to really make an impact mm -hmm. and live a life of, you know, not just success, but significance, where, like, we want to buy a house someday and be able to, you know, house a bunch of up-and-coming players that are struggling to pay rent. Or we have a training camp with, you know, Brazil or Netherlands and like house them at our house right. and let's compete and uh, we want to host and build community. Uh, and right now we're doing, you know, we did a mentorship camp last year uh, and maybe Kelly can talk more about that. But I think it's worth bringing that up and saying like that's why we want to do well in volleyball. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, and it adds on value to who we want to become. Yeah. And now if we don't qualify for this Olympics, if we don't win a gold medal... Uh, doesn't mean we can't do what what we want to do and the impact we want to make and who mm -hmm. we want to become. But I think, uh, yeah, Kelly, I think it's worth sharing about mentorship camp. and Yeah. Yeah, so uh, it's just something that um, I just think it's so cool that both of our passions, like, lined up so well. Volleyball, obviously. Um, like, faith, obviously. But we both love to host and... Um, like bringing people together is really important to us and the next generation of beach volleyball players are really important to us. So just like lined up so perfectly and we we were for a while kind of racking our brains on like what what can we do um, with the platform God has given us, with these gifts that God has given us, how can we best glorify him with all of this? Um, so we uh, last, this last January, we ran a mentorship camp, so we had six pros and six, uh, 13? 13 and 14 13 year olds. 13 or 14 uh -huh. year old girls, so every mentor got a mentee. Oh, awesome. And the agreement with all the mentors was um, that for the rest of the year that they'd get together with their girl once a month and just keep investing in them. Take them out to dinner. That's so cool. Yeah. I didn't know you guys were doing that. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Um. And it was one of the coolest experiences um, I've ever been a part of. So we got an Airbnb in Newport Beach and for three days, I think. Yeah, three, four um, days. 
three full days, um, had the girls get dropped up in the morning, dropped off in the morning and their parents picked them up in the evening, but we did breakfast with them. We went out and did a normal training that we would do. Um, so all the mentors, you know, played with their mentee. Mm -hmm. So all of these 13 year old girls got to play with. So it was me, um, Julia Scholes, um, Haley Harward, April Ross, Gina Urango. And then your girl. And my girl, Sarah Hughes. <laughs> what a um, crew. Such a cool crew. And uh, I just, I, it was so special. Like we, we trained with these girls in the morning. We had lunch. Um, all the mentors took turns like doing little workshops. Um, like we talked about self-worth. We talked about mindfulness. We talked about... Self-talk, being good teammates. Being a good like teammate, yeah. self-talk, yeah. So And then we did like a fun activity in the evening with them. We did an indoor and Olympics, an outdoor Olympics, more <laughs> like cool. fun competition. Yeah, yeah. Had dinner and then their parents picked them up. Um, and I just, I think it was life-changing for these girls. And on top of that, they get to have this lasting relationship with this mentor. Mm. Like this is something that I wish when I was 13 or 14. Imagine if Carrie or Misty took me little me like under their wing yeah. and took me out to dinner once a month and just i just got to talk and soak in everything that they are mm -hmm. um it's just it's been so fun and yeah like the dream is to get a big house one day and be able to do it in our home um until hmm. then we'll be doing like airbnbs but yeah it's just it's so special and I think it's kind of the idea of when you get married, it's like one plus one equals ten. Like right. Like together you are greater than like on your own. And I just think it's so special that we're married and we have this like shared goals, shared visions, shared, you know, purpose together that we get to dive into and pursue together. It's just it's been so special. That's so yeah. cool. Yeah. And what a great crew you picked. And Jordy, you were mentioning, you know, I know this is a volleyball podcast, but yeah. one um, trend that I've seen and that like, and that I saw as I was transcribing all the episodes for the book was that like every, not every single player, but a very common theme, probably like an 80 percenter was players saying that like the f finding something bigger than volleyball yeah. is so crucial mm -hmm. to one having a sustainable career in volleyball or you're just gonna like flame out yeah yep. and it's just like it's just good for your soul and julia is huge on that mm -hmm. and Haley is big on mm -hmm. that and i think april i think now especially now that she's able to look at her career in the rear view i think now she's getting bigger on that yeah. as well yeah um, she's coaching like 10 teams now yeah <laughs> <laughs> while being pregnant <laughs> right. yeah. she's just pouring into everybody so yeah. cool but it's, I think it's super important. That's awesome that you guys are able to do that and yeah. you're able to make an impact on those 13 to 14 year olds. And who knows, like maybe the next Kelly Chang and Sarah Hughes are coming up and then they can have that same ripple effect right? down and you're just creating yeah. like a sweet little wave down the way. Yeah. yeah. So special. Yeah. Good for you guys. Hopefully yeah. that wasn't just like, oh, pat on our backs. It was more of like, that's the driving force of like right. what, what drives us, right? Yeah. That like makes us come alive. And mm -hmm. it's like, mm -hmm. that's part of the reason why we want to win a gold, you know? Right. Yeah. Because imagine... You win a gold, that platform, and what you get to do now with the mentorship camp, with hosting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we don't win, you can still do those things. Right. Yep. Still, yeah. 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 You've still so, done some pretty cool yeah. things. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I think it's fair to say that you haven't like given yourself a pat on the back because I didn't even know that that existed. Like, I've, I've yeah. seen it on social media. So anyway, maybe we're so. just trying to advertise. Good we're we're trying to grow the camp a little bit and <laughs> get a few more mentees and mentors and see yeah. Yeah. see where God takes well, it. Where well, can uh, where can people reach out? it's uh you know to be honest we just kind of been asking like local coaches okay mm -hmm. a big part was trying to find local mentors and yeah. local mentees yeah. so that it's tangible and something that you can again grab dinner yeah. versus like a zoom call right uh, and so i guess younger kids out there just i think every coach kind of has their favorites so yeah. if you're working hard and you're someone who's growth minded it's like uh, you're a living you're, application yeah you're, you're yeah. due you're due to yeah. be noticed that's yeah. how we do uh the zon award is because we yeah. used to do applications, but the first okay. year we did it, we had like 270 some, <laughs> and we were like, well, we oh don't gosh. know what to do with yeah. all of these. And yeah. so now, like me, Katie Spieler, and John Mesco, 
everyone's like, oh, how do I apply? And we're just like, you're applying every day. Like, mm. We're watching. Cool. And so like, we'll like throughout like once a month or every two months, like we'll talk about like who's on the list and like who we like and why. And yeah. then as the year goes on, it's like every day is like sort of a living application, which yeah. seems cool. like what you guys are doing. Yeah. 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 It's pretty similar. Yeah. 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 Well, that's awesome. Well, I'm glad to have you guys both on yeah. the Chang yeah. Family Podcast. I love it. Well, I'll be seeing you guys. This will come out, I think, first day of World Champs. So okay, yeah. So I'll be down there in Mexico. With come you guys. on, let's go. Let's go. Let's, let's go. play some cards, some unicorns. Our let's... last unicorn game got uh, cut short by the pop up hurricane in New Orleans. Oh my gosh, I would have won right. anyway. So don't <laughs> worry about it. Crew, what is us three? Phil. 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 I was wrecking Phil. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was Sarah so Hughes. good. Sarah yeah, I'd wreck him again. Oh, and uh, <laughs> Delaney's sister uh, for my birthday got me two expansion packs Ooh. of unicorns. Which ones? They're coming. It was. Uh, I'll show you when we get back. <laughs> was it the, the, the unrated version? No, it's clean. Okay. It's clean. Yeah, Come on, man. they're Mormons. Come on, <laughs> they don't do uncut, uncut humor. Yeah, we're Christian. We don't do that. We don't do that. Either. We don't do that. Either. Well, I love you guys. Uh, George, you're not on social media. Kel, where can follow people follow your journey? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm mostly on Instagram. Kelly That's Chang. Kelly Chang. Kelly Chang. Got it. I changed it. Yeah. I'm big time That's when now. it's official. Yeah. <laughs> Such so big time, so active on social media. So big time that in in Turkey, uh, oh no, they put China as uh, Chang and Hughes. Oh they saw Chang. That was they so saw, funny. I ran out. And I was like, no, yeah. I'm not from China. Awesome. Oh, that's amazing. And, and the podium for the challenger was two Chinese teams. Yeah. And so I was kind of teasing Sarah, like you're the only Ch- non-Chinese person. There's five Chinese names and Hughes. <laughs> Do you think they, I think one of the funniest things, Jordy, you made me laugh so hard at the wedding when you were like, oh, no. I now, like, Kelly's now, like, the tallest, like, the only 6'1 redhead Chang in the world. Watch our world. <laughs> Amazing. Love you guys. Love Let's you, get man. get some food. Yeah, thanks for having Let's us. Let's do it. Appreciate it, Trav.